Well, welcome this evening, everybody. Um, we are in, what week is this? The sixth, fifth week? I think this is the fifth week. Fifth. fifth. All right. Well, glad you're still showing up. Um, I'm Ben Crenshaw. Um, I am a student here. I'm in my fourth year and hopefully my final year. I'm doing a double MA in New Testament Biblical Studies and in, also in the Apologetics and Ethics program. So I finished up the first one this spring and then I'll eventually finish up the second one, part time probably. So um, yeah, let me just say a word of prayer for us before we get started. God, we thank you for this evening and for gathering us here. We pray that tonight's lecture would be enlightening and helpful, um, clarifying, um, and ultimately would um, help draw us to yourself. Um, we just pray that you would help me to speak clearly, think clearly, communicate some of these concepts which are uh, tricky to get a hold of. Um, and I just pray that you bless this time. In your name, amen. amen. So today we're looking at the problem of suffering. And I have, <clears throat> I've termed it the problem of evil and suffering because they really go hand in hand. The reason we suffer is because there's evil in the world. So, um, obviously, this topic may not be the most cheery topic in the world, um, but I do think it's um, really, really, really important. And yeah, I, I asked Sarah if I could teach on this because um, it's kind of close to my heart, something that I've wrestled really, really deeply with over the past, um, I don't know, probably eight to ten years. So it's something I've thought a lot about, read a lot about, and I've come to some conclusions regarding, although... I'm still in the process. So anyway, um, let's start with the first point. Does everyone have an outline? And just so you know, I pretty much followed what Craig did in the book, if you all read the book. But I threw in a few extra things and kind of tried to give some context and so forth. So hopefully most of this will sound familiar. If you have any questions, we'll definitely address them. Feel free to raise your hand right away. And I'll take any questions you have and do my best. So first of all, a little context, the urgency of the problem of evil and suffering. So I don't have any statistics, um, and I don't have any hard social science data to back this up, but my sense is that the problem of evil is, first of all, probably the number one obstacle that prevents people from coming to faith in Christ. It's probably the number one thing that causes people to doubt either God's existence in the first place, or that they would ever want to know a God like, a God who allows as much evil and suffering in the world that there is, or that God is good and he would uh, want their best and so forth. So it's a major obstacle and impediment to people even coming to Christianity in the first place. Um, second, it's probably the number one reason people leave Christianity. Those who are Christians leave Christianity because evil is so difficult Suffering is so difficult to explain on Christian theism. And um, I, I don't personally know anyone who's left Christianity because of evil and suffering in the world, but I've definitely read plenty of stories um, and know other people who know people who have. So friends who have know people who have left Christianity. And then also, for anyone who is a Christian, um, evil and suffering is... One of the, one, the biggest reasons for severe doubt about God's love, his goodness, his power, and all of this um, cripples a person's ability to trust God, to have joy, to have peace, to enter into fully into the Christian life and the life of the church. So it's a major problem, both for um, believers and unbelievers. So that's why I think it's, it's really important that we take a little while here to um, just think critically and carefully about the problem the topic. So let's first put evil and suffering in context. And I know Craig did some of this in the book. Um, it's kind of sprinkled throughout the chapter. He didn't really necessarily start it that way. Actually, Craig starts the chapter talking about um, atheism and how they try to redefine it. I'm just going to skip all that because it's kind of an add-on that he put in at the beginning of this chapter. I think that everything he said there was relatively straightforward, and I agree with it. So I'm starting essentially where he does on page 151 with the argument from suffering. So to put this in context, 
The problem of evil and suffering is not unique to Christianity. The problem of evil and suffering is a problem for everybody. I don't care whether you're a Christian, whether you're an atheist, whether you're agnostic, whether you're a Buddhist, or a Hindu, whether you're Muslim, whether you're New Age, whether you're a Scientologist, or whatever. I don't care. You have a problem of evil and suffering because you live in this world. So it's not unique to Christianity. And if you're talking with somebody who's skeptical about Christianity, they're likely to bring it up as a major problem for Christianity. Precisely for the reasons we're going to go through, because we do believe in a God who uh, is all-powerful, all-knowing. He's perfectly good. So how do you explain evil given Christian, Christianity's claim of, of a God like that? But say, take, for example, and I'm sure you might have already heard this or saw this. I think Craig does go over it in the book. On atheism, if we use the moral argument from either last week or the week before, um, evil and good and evil become extremely difficult, if not impossible, to even explain on atheism. There should, there's no such thing as good or evil. It's just socially acceptable, fashionable ways of living and behavior, socially unacceptable and unfashionable ways of living and behavior. So in context, yes, <coughs> the problem of evil and suffering is a problem for Christianity, but it's a problem for every other religion, every other person, regardless of the creed or the religious uh, beliefs that they have. Second, for Christians, this is not an isolated issue, apart from the other natural theological arguments. Most of these, which we've already gone over, I added in, uh, such as the ontological argument, um, religious experience, and the witness of the Holy Spirit. We haven't touched on those yet. But there's a reason, there's a reason why Craig has this chapter as, let's see, chapter 7 in this book. He doesn't start off with it. He gives a whole lot of other um, arguments for God's existence for good reasons and justifications for believing in God's existence and the kind of character of the God of the Bible. Um, actually, that pro we haven't really gone over that except for perhaps the moral argument. But um, that, would be, that would be part of uh, an argument from the historical reliability of the gospel and the life of Christ and his resurrection and so forth. So anyway, all of this talk about evil and suffering has to be put in the backdrop of that. And then finally, this argument can both be a what's called a natural atheological argument, meaning it's, a, it's an, um, an argument put forward by opponents of Christianity as supposed uh, uh, evidence that God doesn't exist or he's not the kind of God that Christians say. So it can be used as an objection to Christianity, but it can also be turned or flipped around like I've already kind of explained, and be used um, as evidence for God's existence because objective moral values and duties do have to exist. And that's how we know that some things truly are evil. And we'll, talk, we'll get to that and talk about it a little bit more. So this is not exclusively an argument against Christianity, although that's often how you'll encounter it or how it will be written about. So let's go to uh, Roman numeral three. We have which problem? So... On page 152, this is where Craig has the diagram. And if you do any kind of research on the problem of evil, you're going to run into this diagram and this division all over the place. So it's very, very common. And I think it's valid, although I want to qualify it a little bit. So we have the emotional problem of evil on the one hand and the intellectual problem of evil on the other hand. So the emotional problem often also known as the existential problem or the psychological problem, is dealing with how do I function day to day in the face of evil and suffering? How do I um, face it? How do I overcome it? How do I keep going? How do I respond emotionally, interrelationally, so forth and so on? The intellectual problem is really a question of the coexistence of the God of Christian theism on the one hand and the reality of suffering and evil on the other. And then the intellectual, also known as the philosophical problem or the theoretical problem, can be broken down into the logical problem and then the evidential or probabilistic problem of evil. And of course, as Craig, Dim as Craig goes through, the logical problem is the issue of just uh, straight logical, uh, possible. is it logically possible for evil and God to coexist, as opposed to is it just probable that God and evil can coexist? So first of all, I want to say a couple things. I think I have three points under this that I want to, to make. First of all, 
when people um, bring up the problem of evil, they often are starting from, a, from the emotional or psychological point of view. And then they jump right into the philosophical issue of, well, because I'm struggling so much, I'm facing this evil, I see this issue, this evil in the world, I can't explain it, it's terrible for me, uh, so forth and so on, therefore God doesn't exist. Or therefore God is different, or so forth and so on. Christianity is not true. So they jump, they jump between these, they don't even know they're making this jump. So, um, I just think it's important that we, if we're dialoguing and talking with someone about this, that we um, make this distinction. And this isn't a, um, an exclusive distinction. We're not saying here that, oh, if you're going to study the problem of evil philosophically, then you've got to shut off your emotions. You can't feel, all you've got to do is think, like a robot or something like that. Of course not, we're human beings. These are, these are uh, intertwined in our daily lives, although they can, you can stop and think about evil and God, as opposed to figuring out how to um, feel and react to it. So that kind of leads to my second issue of the relationship of the life of the mind to emotions, behavior, and character. So if you flip, I don't know, I have a different one, but the diagram, I guess it's on page three here. I kind of sketched this out real fast, and this is, um, this is one possible way of seeing the relationship of the life of the mind to how we see or perceive the world, our feelings, our volition or will, our desires, all of which go into determining how we behave, which then influences our character, who we become, who we are. So this isn't, uh, this isn't like, um, you know, this is how it works for everybody and this is only how it works. You can also, I think, learn a lot of things by feeling and by reflecting on your feelings or by, um, you know, considering your behavior and then reflecting on that, so forth. So it, you're the, the, the life of the mind and your feelings and your behavior and your character, they're all intertwined, but it's to say that how you think can determine how you see, how you feel, how you will, how you desire, which then influences behavior and character. So that's why it's important that maybe if you want to feel differently about the problem of evil, or if you want to behave differently in the face of terrible evil, you should stop and think about it first. You stop and think about it, and you come to some conclusions or some piece about uh, you know, how you know, God and evil can coexist, um, God's relationship to evil, how he relates to evil, so forth, then that can change how you feel. It can change how you behave, which will then influence your character. So I just think it's important that um, even though we've split these off into the emotional and the intellectual, we see how they're related. And then my third point is that, and I'll, I'll make this further on as well, and Craig also made this point, is that solutions you have for the intellectual problem of evil can aid the emotional problem. Um, let's see. I, I kind of just touched on that. So I think that that's pretty... Uh, um, um, self-explanatory. You know, sometimes I've heard some, some philosophers say, well, you know, if you're dealing with the emotional problem of evil, you should go see a pastor and talk to them, or a counselor and talk to them. And I say, sure, I don't mind that, that's good. You know, maybe you need a, you need a support group, or you just need um, a close friend or a spouse or somebody like that. But if you're struggling with the emotional problem of evil, you can use the intellectual issues surrounding it as an aid, so that it kind of like fits in underneath the emotional problem of evil as um, a solution or just an aid. So any questions so far? Okay, good. And you guys are easy. <laughs> okay, point, uh, um, point four. So we're gonna look at the intellectual problem first and then hopefully we'll get to the probabilistic problem and then um, the emotional problem. So, uh, so first we're starting with the, the intellectual, the philosophical, we're gonna break it into its logical and evidential. However, I first wanna make a note, of it, a note between the difference of a, um, a defense versus a theodicy. Now, you, now I don't think Craig says this, he doesn't. But anyway, um, he ends up, in the book, he ends up giving what's called the free will defense. 
And we're going to go through that. And he starts it on, on page 154 and 155. He doesn't actually say this, but that's, the def that's what he's using. Um, so what's the difference between the defense that Craig is giving and a theodicy? Does it, I mean, does anyone want to take a stab at this? I guess, oh no, I don't give the definition. I'll let you write it in. Anyone want to just take a stab at the difference between it in terms of your answer to the problem of God's existence and the existence of suffering and evil, the difference between a theodicy and a defense? I know you know Sarah, so you can't say. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. If you, if you don't, I'll just go, I'll go ahead. But, you know, feel free to jump in. So a defense is um, merely the attempt to give one possible answer to this problem of God's existence and the existence of evil. It's a possible account of how God and evil can coexist. It doesn't actually claim to be true. It just is coherent. So a defense is actually a weaker stance to take than a theodicy. We'll get to a theodicy in a second. So a, def a defense simply set is simply kind of answering the, the, the logical question, well, how can these made to coexist? How can they be logically coherent? And it, no, and it could actually totally be false. But as long as it's logically coherent, it works as an answer to logical problems. So that's what a defense is. A theodicy, on the other hand, is actually giving a, oh, and I give two examples here, the free will defense and the greater good defense. And the free, free will defense, um, will, uh, we'll talk about both of these. The free will defense was first, um, I think it was first uh, talked about or um, discussed by St. Augustine of Hippo, who was a 4th and 5th century church father, AD. Um, so a theodicy, on the other hand, does attempt to give a true and factual account of how things actually are in reality. It's not just saying, well, this is possible in some possible world or another world that God created. No, this is how it actually is. And an example would be the soul-making theodicy, um, and we're going to get into that. And this was first uh, proposed by Irenaeus. Irenaeus, and he was the bishop in Gaul um, around the 2nd century AD, 2nd to 3rd century AD. And then it was later um, propounded, expanded upon, and really um, embellished by a gentleman named John Hick in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and we might talk about John Hick in a, a little bit later, I don't know. I have a few things to say about him. but um, So anyway, soul-making theodicy is, one, is, is different than um, a defense, such as the free will defense, the greater good defense. So does everyone understand the difference here? And the difference is very important, because when you get to something like the logical problem of evil, it wouldn't be a good idea, necessarily, to give a theodicy, because you're actually over-arguing your case. It's kind of like in a court of law. Is there, I think there's... there's one's enough? Great. So in a court of law, kind of one of the, the standard um, pieces of advice is you, you don't um, overextend yourself. You, you make the, the best case or the, the, um, the best case possible, possible for your client, but only as much as you need to. So you don't over-argue. You don't try to overprove that he was innocent or he was, wait, the other side was guilty or something like that. So the same thing goes here. If you're facing the logical problem of evil, you could overextend yourself if you try to give a theodicy and say, well, this is how things actually are, when in fact a defense is sufficient to be able to say, I don't know if this is how things are, but it's very possible. It could be this way, and that's enough to answer the question. Ben? Yeah? Could you maybe talk about what sorts of situations that might apply? I mean, what your antagonist might be saying that would allow, or that would make your uh, defense sufficient? Like on this topic? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I mean, I guess the example would be the logical problem of evil, and I'm going to get to that. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's... I guess I don't, I don't really know much more to say than I have in terms of if someone's saying that God's existence and the existence of evil are logically incoherent, and you can say, well, they're really not, and I can give a possible account of how these logically cohere, even if I don't know if it's true. Meaning, it would take so much more to try to prove that it's true that it could hold, the whole argument could fall apart. So mostly you find, I mean, mostly you find this distinction in kind of like um, major journals or philosophical papers and so forth, where uh, y you have these um, um, discussions going on. I, I suppose that it is, um, it would be fine to use this over, like, say, a dinner conversation or something like that. If somebody is actually making the logical, um, uh, pro uh, making the argument from the logical problem of evil, is that kind of mm -hmm. okay? I was just trying to get it to figure, uh, get us to think about how that might actually look in look in real life. Yeah, yeah. It can, I guess it can be a little bit abstract, um, and I suppose that here's the other thing: the free will defense <clears throat> and the greater good defense. Some people might take those to be, oh, I'll get right there. Some people might take those to be theodicies. They might say, I actually really do believe the free will defense is true. But you don't, but the classic formulation of the free will defense by Alvin Plantinga, who's a, who was a Christian philosopher at Notre Dame, he didn't want to make it a theodicy because he thought that would be overstating his case. Yes? Um, I've only heard the term theodicy with the question of evil, is it exclusively used with this, or are there other domains in which you might find it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it is, ex as far as I know, it's exclusive. Mm -hmm. Theodicy is exclusive to the problem of evil, because I think it does relate specifically to evil and God. Oh. Gotcha. Um, nice. I guess, the you know, if you were going to give, um, give an argument out, outside of the problem of evil, kind of along these lines, it might be called an apologetic or something like that, or just an argument or a case or something. But yeah, I think, I, I do believe that the Odyssey is specific to the problem. Okay, goody. Now we come to the logical problem of evil. Um, okay, so this is the claim that it's log it is, um, is it logically possible for God and evil to coexist? So, um, So the argument that I have here is actually a little bit different than what Craig gave in the book. Um, where'd my marker go? Here. So we have three premises here. The first is that God is omnipotent. And let's see, how does, well, he, Craig just says an all-loving, all-powerful God exists. So I've kind of split the first premise in Craig's book on page 155 and into the first two premises. So your first premise is, um, God is omnipotent or all powerful. And then the second premise is that God is wholly good or om omnibenevolent. And then the, the third premise, notice that it's a premise, not a conclusion. The third premise. Is that let's see how it is that evil exists? That's kind of obvious. Now, I think Craig. Um, Craig goes uh, in the book. He says he makes this distinction between an explicit and an implicit contradiction. So what you see here, first of all, is this is, doesn't follow, this argument, so to speak, it's really not an argument, doesn't follow any of the argument forms. It's not deductive, it's not inductive, it's not abductive, it's nothing like that. It's just three propositions. Three propositions that somehow are supposed to be transparent to all of us that there's somewhere a contradiction in there. And it can seem that way. It can seem that way. It can feel that way. It can even like look that way. But there are hidden premises. So this isn't a, an explicit... Um, contradiction. If there was an explicit contradiction, contradiction, then we might have like, God is omnipotent, evil exists, God is impotent, 
or something like that, where, where two of the, the, the propositions or premises clearly one negates the other, or one contradicts the other. We don't have that here. So, we have to look at the hidden premises. So, the first hidden premise is that if God is omnipotent, he can create any world he wants. So, I've called this P1A. And then the second hidden premise is, if God is wholly good, then he'd prefer a world without suffering and evil. I'll call this P2A. understand those two hidden premises that are kind of deduced from P1 and P2. If God is omnipotent, that means that he can, it, it, when he's creating, at the, at the moment of his creative decree, well, he could create anything he wants. P2, God is wholly good, implies, supposedly, if God is wholly good, then he prefers a world without evil. So this give us, gives us the first conclusion. You can see here, what I've done is I've meshed the three, premise, the three um, premises that we had originally with the two hidden premises and made a more complete argument that would, I think would be deductive. So the first conclusion, I'll call this C1, is that therefore if God is omnipotent and holy good, he would in fact create a world without suffering and evil. If God is, we'll call him O, and holy good, he would create a world without evil. And then we have the, th uh, the third premise, evil exists, and then from that we get our second conclusion, that therefore God is either not omnipotent or not wholly good. And then the final conclusion is therefore God, I, I put it this way, therefore God is not God and that means he doesn't exist. And I'll explain that in a minute. God is not God, i.e., he does not exist. Use my fingers. Okay, can anyone take a stab at why you think if we deny God his omnipotence on the one hand or his moral perfection, his omnibenevolence on the other hand, God ceases to exist? Any thoughts on that? Anyone can just take a stab at it and not chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, this comes from what's no. Well, this really just comes from the definition of God. What does it mean for God to be God? And this is known as perfect being theology, and I'm not going to get off into that. Um, but basically, if God lacks certain attributes or characteristics to their maximal amount, then he's not God. He's not the greatest conceivable being. He is not, the, um, he does not qualify as a God. So if God is uh, as powerful as he can be, except he's one tiny little notch below being omnipotent, then he's not all powerful. He's not omnipotent, and he doesn't qualify as being God. If God is morally perfect in every single way except one time he lies, then he's not morally perfect, and he's no longer God. So if you deny God either of these attributes of omnipotence or moral perfection, 
even to the slightest amount, then you've actually destroyed at least the Christian concept of God, who is the greatest conceivable being, who is perfect in every way. So, this is the more complete uh, argument that we get from those three um, bare premises at the very beginning. And this, this is a lot more complicated. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different elements. <laughs> and I mean, this can probably be formulated in a lot of different ways. And you'll see, if you were to read a book such as um, God, Freedom, and Evil by Alvin Plantiga, he um, takes the first, like, I don't know, 80 pages on this, on the problem of evil, and he gives some very, very long uh, formulas of this and then refutes it. So it's, it can become more complex, but I think that's a pretty simple way to be able to kind of like see what it actually it is we're dealing with and not let somebody who's objecting um, from the problem of evil kind of pull a fast one on you and say, well, you know, God is omnipotent. Kind of like what, we, what I put at the very top of the lecture, this quote by David Hume, I don't know if you've seen this before, where Hume says, is he, speaking of God, willing to prevent evil, but not able, able, then he is on is, he is impotent. Is he willing is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? So that's exactly Hume's argument. He takes those three bare premises and says, Ergo, either evil shouldn't exist or God shouldn't exist. But it's more complex than that. So any questions on this? formula or how we got there, um, anything at all. Man, I just must be making sense. <laughs> okay, so let's go to point six, solutions to the logical problem of evil. So we have kind of three, three, different, three different solutions we could look at. Uh, the free will defense, the greater good defense, or the soul-making theodicy. Now, these are not exclusive. In fact, Craig uses all three. He starts with the free will defense, then he goes into the greater good defense with the evidential problem of evil, and then he finally turns to the soul-making theodicy, although he doesn't technically say that. So these are not ex mutually exclusive, although they are distinct. They're not exclusive. You can use all three, and they can buttress each other and so forth and so on. Um, now, it is good to realize that the free will defense focuses on the origin of evil. Where does evil come from? How did evil come to into existence or into being in the first place? Where the, both the greater good defense and the soul-making theodicy are more concerned with the purpose of evil or the end of evil. It's kind of a, a teleological view, like taking the long view. Why does evil exist? What comes of it? What purpose does it serve? And technically, <clears throat> the soul-making theodicy is a form of the greater good defense. It's one, one expression of that. But it's very specific to the individual. So let's see. The free will defense. OK, here we go. Now, do any, after reading Craig's presentation, uh, uh, his response to the logical problem of evil, did anybody feel lost? Okay, yeah. I felt lost with like where he kind of starts to go into free will, like yeah. just right after that. Yeah. Like I feel like there was another like a backstory to that. Is there another option? Like what would I mean? I don't know. I feel like maybe I've run into this like argument before where someone says, "Well, what about you know what if free will doesn't exist, or how does free will even exist if like if God is making things happen in the world?" people really have free will? Great questions. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. I was hoping someone would say that. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, yeah that's, kind of, that's the issue. He does jump right into free will and says, he sa he's, well, I'm going to get to it. He says, it's logically impossible to make someone do something freely. Boom, right there. And he's kind of um, banking on a prior discussion of free will and what free will is. And I don't know if you saw <clears throat> on the... Si uh, let's see, the sidebar on page 156 here, he talks about the freedom of the will very briefly. He talks about two different options for the freedom of the will. Um, but that's kind of, he shoehorned that in on the side. Um, but, you know, I understand this is a beginning level book and it's only 300 pages, so you couldn't do everything. But yes, that's a great question. 
you know, how does free will exist? What is the will? What is free will? Um, you know, so forth and so on. So we're going to get to that in a minute. Any other thoughts or like confusions trying to read through the free will defense that Craig was giving? Anything like that? Okay. So we have, we're going to start with this guy first. If God is omnipotent, he can create any world that he wants. Now, what Craig is, um, the premise he's working on is a, a, a definition of free will known as libertarian free will. So, libertarian free will says that a person's choices or their actions are not causally determined. And I have this in the middle of the page. I think it's on page six. Wherever we are. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, it's a different place. Kind of the top of the page. Um, so you're not causally determined. And we can, I mean, uh, looking at the time, I don't want to get deep, deep into causal determinism and things like this. But, you know, a basic definition of causal determinism would be for every event that happens, there are previous events and circumstances which are the necessary causes or conditions so that if these previous causes and conditions occur, you, that event or your choice will, in fact, happen. It couldn't happen any other way. So causal determinism says if you have these previous conditions or causes, then this necessarily follows an action or event or a circumstance or something like that. So that's kind of the, the real quick on causal determinism. And then on libertarian freedom, you are not causally determined, meaning there's nothing in the external world or kind of like biologically within you that forces you to make decisions or act in any other way. You're self-determining. You're self-determining, meaning you are the locus of your own decisions, your own choices, your own actions. You decide whether or not you're going to sign up for this class, come tonight, whether I'm going to do my homework tomorrow. Whatever, you know? <laughs> you, you, you yourself make the decision. Which means, in most every <clears throat> life situation, you're going to have the ability in any event to choose other than you did choose. So you could have signed up for this class, or you could have decided not to. When you go home tonight, you could go to bed at 10 o'clock, but you could stay up to 10.30. So you have this ability to choose otherwise. I'll stay up later. <laughs> Unless my wife makes me go to bed. <laughs> so the, two, the two, as, two important aspects of libertarian freedom is that you're not causally determined, which usually means in any decision or action you make, you could do other than what you in fact do. So it's thought that these uh, are requirements for you to have moral responsibility or culpability. So, I mean, we, I think we take it as a matter of fact that, you know, if you were out shopping and you um, come, come back to your car and you're putting your groceries in your car or whatever and someone puts a gun to your head and they say, get in the car and drive, and you get in the car and you drive and you're speeding down the highway and you're going 101 and the police officer pulls you over and you arrest the dude and he comes over to you and says, you're going 101, you're under arrest. You would say, what officer? <laughs> I didn't have a choice. I had a gun to my head. So in that case, because, I mean, technically you do have a choice. I suppose you could decide to be shot in the head, but that's not very <laughs> realistic. So, the, so we understand both in everyday experiences and in the law that in a, in a coercive, manipulative situation like that, when you really couldn't do anything else, you're, you're, um, you're essentially not morally responsible for your actions. And the same, the same idea is true here. If you're causally determined so that you can't do anything else, that destroys moral responsibility. So that's, that's an added, added aspect. So how does this relate to uh, God's creation of the world and the existence of evil and so forth? So um, the question is, could God create any world that he wanted to? Well, let's say that we assume that in order for um, 
a person to be free, they had to have libertarian freedom. So they're not causally determined, and they could choose other than they do choose in any circumstance. So God cannot, in that case, if God wants to have free creatures, he cannot guarantee that they will act in a certain way. He cannot guarantee that they will choose a certain way. Because if he causally determines them to always choose the good, well, they're not free. And that's the very definition. That's, that's ex essentially what libertarian freedom means in this case. If God says, well, I know that you know, in this situation, Ben's going to do the right thing, and this one's going to do the right thing, and this one's going to do the wrong thing, so I'm going to causally determine him to do the wrong thing, it destroys my free will, it destroys my moral responsibility, so that I, I can't essentially be blamed for that. God is the one responsible for everything that I do. So, the reason that God can't create any world that he wants is because he has to take into consideration this libertarian freedom that human beings have, whereby they could choose to do other than what God wants them to do. And in fact, that is the very definition of sin, if we have God's will or his desire, to sin is to choose other than God's will or desire. That's a basic definition of sin, to, to will against the will of God. Now, is it possible for God to sin? If that's the definition of sin, is it possible for God to sin? And we say no. Because if God willed, other than what he was going to will, he was willing it, and that was his will. You know? And it, so, like, it's not, on that definition, it's not possible for God to sin because whatever he wills is, in fact, his will. Now, we could get off into to moral theory, and we talked about the youth of dilemma last week or the week before, where, what was last week? Was last week the moral argument? Yes. Okay, so yeah, we talked about the youth of dilemma, where, you know, God can't just capriciously decide to will whatever he wants because his will is in keeping with his very essence or nature. But anyway, so if God's going to create free people, free people that have the ability to choose otherwise, they have to have the ability to choose against God's will, which means God had to give them the ability to sin. The ability to sin. Now, that doesn't guarantee that they will sin on the one hand or they won't sin on the other hand. Whether or not they sin is up to them. It's self-determining on libertarian free will. They decide whether or not they will sin. They decide whether or not they will align their will with God's will. And that is what, it's up to them whether or not evil comes into existence. Now, it could be that God, you know, Craig and Planiga and others who argue from this perspective would say, you know, if God had wanted to create a world without, without evil and suffering, he could have done it. How? We could have destroyed human freedom, and he just could have causally determined everything to be perfect. Now, we would say, or Craig would say, God didn't do that because his very reason for creating in the first place was to have fellowship with his creation. To have fellowship with his creation. And in order to have a genuine relationship with somebody, what do you need? You need free will. You need the other person to be to willingly enter into a genuine relationship. So God, so on this case, God was in a kind of in a dilemma. He either destroys free will and accomplishes a world without suffering and evil, or he allows for the possibility of free people whom he can genuinely have a relationship with, who will genuinely come to know him and love him, and he will love them back. But that opened up the possibility of evil and suffering existing. And it so turned out that because Adam and Eve self-determined that they would choose against God's will, desire against God's will, act against God's will, that evil and suffering did, in fact, come into existence, into the world. So that's, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, kind of introduction, I think you sort of got there, but like, I guess what was um, the, the fantasy, like someone said, like, well, wouldn't the best good for creation be to have God take away our freedom and just have everything go according to his plan. But I guess like I guess how would you articulate that like the best good in this case would be having a fulfilled relationship? Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's a good question. Yeah, sometimes <clears throat> I've thought, hey God, you know, I'd almost rather be a robot. You know, I'd rather be a puppet and just kind of do what you want me to do, and I don't, you know, whatever if I have a relationship with you, as long as you just take away the evil in the world. You know, come on, give me a puppet. Um, now, 
I think you would actually, I mean, you could possibly make an argument from the nature of the Trinity and the relationship within the Trinity for fellowship and the priority of fellowship. Um, I think you, would, you could also make an argument from Scripture, although, I mean, at this point, you'd probably have to argue first for the historical reliability of scripture, <laughs> canonicity. You know, we don't want a circular reasoning here. But um, you could make an argument from scripture that that's what you see. You see God's deep desire to know his creation. I mean, you see it in his relationship with Adam and Eve. He walked and talked with them in the garden. You see it with his uh, appeals to um, you know, people to repent between the time of Adam and Noah. You see him rescuing Noah, calling Abraham, calling the Israelites. Why? To be a blessing to the nations so that the knowledge of God could come to all the nations. You see him sending the Messiah in order to reconcile all things, all people, all things to himself. So you could make an argument from Scripture that says God cares so very, very deeply about relationship and genuine relationship, and that requires free will which then opens up the possibility for suffering and evil. Um, yeah, I guess that's the best I would... I, 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 I should think about that more, but that's the best I could do off the top of my head. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So we mentioned Adam and Eve and their sin. Why were they the only ones that had that choice to begin with? Why do we start as sinners instead of starting without sin and making that choice too? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> you know, God created Adam and Eve innocent. He didn't create them perfect. More, if they were morally perfect, they would have never sinned. Hmm. He created them innocent. They hadn't yet sinned, and they didn't. There was nothing that was forcing them to sin or determining. At least on this account, there was nothing that was forcing them or determining them to sin. There was nothing inevitable about them sinning. So them sinning was their their own decision. And I don't think we can know from the literary structure of Genesis how long it was before they, they sinned. I mean, it kinda, you kind of get the sense, it's like, oh gosh, that was a day. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it was, but I mean, it could have been a month, it could have been a year. I don't know how long it was. How long did Adam and Eve fellowship with God before they did sin? And it could have been that, okay, God could maybe God could have created another world where they didn't sin for 50 years, or 900 years, or something like that. But on this account, Greg would say it's possible that there was no world that God could create where they didn't eventually end up sinning due to their own decision. So, I mean, then we'd have to hop right into the, the issue of the compatibility of God's omniscience and human freedom, and that's a totally different debate that I'm not going to get into tonight, but that's super fun and interesting if you ever want to talk to me. Um, so, yeah, does that answer your question? I think I'm more asking why was he our representative instead of each of us starting out in that innocent state and then... Yeah, okay. Now this is good too. Um, <laughs> so you're asking a question about original sin. Yeah. I yeah. So. Now there are different um, ways of explaining original sin. Some people hold to the what's known as inherited guilt. So Adam, um, either as our representative head or as a literal, you know, like we were literally in Adam in some way, um, he, his guilt is transferred to all of us, or we were kind of there in some way, and so when he sinned, we sinned. So at the moment of conception, inherited guilt would say, you are guilty of sin before God, and you are worthy of condemnation. Um, other accounts say, no, you are born innocent. You don't actually incur guilt and condemnation until you sin. And in fact, there's what's known as an age of accountability, where it's you don't you, even if you say sin or morally trespass a law or something as a little child, because you're not aware that you're sinning or there is such a thing as a moral law and a right and wrong, then you're not held responsible or accountable for it. So if you so some people interpret original sin as an age of accountability, and you're when you when you in fact sin, there th at that point you become sinful and um, you incur guilt and condemnation and so forth like that, and then you of course need a savior. Now, um, I think scripture can be interpreted either way. I think it's um, somewhat indeterminate. Um, so. Either one of these accounts is possible. And um, 
much more can be said on that. But not, you know, not everyone says that simply because Adam sinned, therefore, we're all, you know, condemned for the moment of conception as well. So there are uh, there are other options on that. Yes. Now, real quickly, I'll just add too, and that was a good explanation. But one way to think about it is that uh, rather than Adam almost causing everyone else to sin, um, the, the better way to look at that is to, to say when Adam sinned, something in, the, in, in what it means to be a human being changed. And, and so as human beings, we have something wrong now. It's not just, it's not even that we will commit a sin in the singular sense. You know, we, it's not about sins, uh, plural. It's about what sort of creature are we now. And we're beings with some kind of pre proclivity towards yeah. sin. So uh, it's more of a, a general statement about what sorts of descendants Adam would have at that from that point onward. Yeah. And the proclivity to sin would say that <clears throat> at some point in your life, you will in fact sin. But at no specific point do you have to sin. That brings us to philosophical problems, but that's the um, you know that's the gist of the idea that you 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 are so set on this track to sin that you will in fact at some point sin. So let's um, let's go back and look at the the last thing I say before number two under this analysis of the hidden premises. I say since this account of libertarian human freedom um, places constraints on God's ability to create any world He desires. Um, Okay, because this is logically possible, even if it's false. So even if the account of libertarian freedom and God's relationship between his creation and his free agents, even this is, if this is false, because it's logically possible, it's sufficient to refute this premise, which says it is, uh, you know, God can create any world he wants. Yeah. So... Just because he, um, the strength of the statement there regarding the refutation of that premise, can God desire to create that which he knows is impossible to create? Well, he might, des I, don't, I don't know. I mean, can you desire, I mean, can God desire to create a round square um, or, you know, make six a prime number? I don't know. I suppose you could desire to do the logically impossible, but I'm not sure why you would want to. Well, I'm just curious if that would be an imperfection, to desire that which you know is not actualizable. No, I don't... Well, you mean the desire is an, is an imperfection? Yeah. It's the desire of something that you know cannot be actualized. You are essentially acting in... in you are you're entertaining through your will something that you know cannot be. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It, it could be an imperfection. I don't. I don't. I don't really know how to uh, analyze that. But that's fine. So <clears throat> now, it's it's also possible that someone would say that um, this account of libertarian freedom is logically incoherent or is logically contradictory, and in this case, this account of libertarian freedom and God's creation may not actually be enough to deal with this, if it in itself is logically incoherent. But you'll have uh, some pretty bright philosophers that will argue very, very strongly that it is logically coherent and, in fact, necessary. So, so the, the issue here is that as long as this account of libertarian freedom, which places constraints on God's ability to just create any world he wants, is coherent as possible, then this is not necessarily true. And so the person who's arguing that God's omnipotence, meaning he can create any world he wants to, well, that's not necessarily true, which means this argument doesn't go through. Yeah? I just had, um, isn't it plausible that God could make a world without free will? I mean, how do, why does free will have to be in the world in order for, I mean, he could theoretically make a world that is for just all robots. Right, he could. He could. But it's not that God um, 
it's, it's, it's not that um, there are other possibilities open to God, but that there is one possible explanation that would negate the idea that, um, you know, on, um, that God can create any world he wants to given libertarian freedom. So the assumption, the assumption here is that God is creating humans, and he's creating, and he, and he, he has to cre create them free. Well, I mean, I suppose he doesn't have to. But if we're going to have a world with free creatures, then, um, you know, he has to take into account their free decisions. Yeah, go ahead. Would a better way, of, uh, a way that is kind of possible, in order for God to make a world where it fits his character of humans being in a relationship with him, there has to be free will, therefore, put constraints on it, is that... Yeah. Way to think of it. Yeah, you could put it that way. You could also say, given the fact that we know that we have, well, <laughs> some people deny this, but we'd say existentially, in everyday experience, we know we have free will. We know we're free creatures. We know this is a reality. And the best explanation for free will is libertarian freedom. In fact, they, Craig would say this is the only coherent explanation. Because if you're causally determined, then you're not free. That's what he, that's just kind of like, that's kind of his, um, his uh, brute fact. Just drop me in. <laughs> Sarah thinks <laughs> of <laughs> um, So, so we, would, we would start with the fact that we exist, we're humans, we have freedom. We know that we're not, we don't, at least we don't have the experience of being causally determined. Now I suppose you could say we're all deceived. We're all, you know, um, you know, an illusion of free will and we don't in fact have free will. But if you, so that's why the, in order for the free will defense to work, you kind of have to start with the prior discussion of human freedom, and what does that look like, and what does that mean, and human will, and what is that, and so forth and so on. So it's basically, so I'm like, we are kind of, like, kind of pushing the argument back into that. So it, Craig assumes libertarian freedom, and that we are free creatures, and we have this freedom, and therefore that places constraints on God, which means he can't create any more he wants. Yeah. And even with this argument, um, since we're still in the category of um, defense, you know, what, all, the only thing we're trying to do at this point is in premise 1A, when it says if God's omnipotent, he can create any world, all we're trying to do is say, that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. You know, it's, it's a hypothetical. Uh, you can say, I agree with Craig. I don't <laughs> on I do. that one. But... <laughs> but um, I am willing to say that's a good enough account to show that logically that is not the case. Yeah. So, because you can just come up with at least one counterexample, at least one example where that isn't that may not be the case. Right. So, does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> now, um, on the little diagram at the bottom of page six, I kind of have this split up and you can see that there are different accounts of human freedom. And I don't want to take too long in this, I kind of want to move on because we only got 15 minutes, but the other account of freedom is compatibilist freedom, which says that human beings can be truly free and causally determined at the same time. So the libertarian person is going to use the free will defense, probably first and foremost. They'll, often, they'll also make use of the soul-making theodicy and they'll make use of the greater good defense. Whereas, if you start with compatibilist freedom, you won't use the free will defense. You'll only use the greater good defense and the soul-making theodicy. So this is an issue with, with, within kind of an, an inner debate within Christianity, uh, within Christians of, you know, whether, whatever account of human freedom you take, you're going to answer the question of the logical problem of evil differently. You're going to answer the question of, of um, the ev evil and suffering differently. Dr. Grotheis is a compatibilist, so he, in his chapter on evil, he gives his account of um, freedom and free will and how um, that works together with evil and humans and God's existence and so forth and so on. So if you want to read his view on it, which is very different than Craig's take, his chapter in here, I think it's the second to the last or the last chapter, um, is, his, is, a, is a, just a very different uh, way of answering this question. So let's get to the let's get to the second premise, P two A. If God is holy good, He would prefer a world without suffering and evil. 
So, first we say, God just might have morally justified reasons to permit all the evil and suffering that he does. Now, if it's even possible that God has one morally justifying reason, reason for permitting evil, then this invalidates this premise. Because on this premise, you know, God totally prefers, I mean, prefers might be kind of a weak word. Um, you know, I prefer, but no, no, like, this is what he, he wills. Like, he, he will always, because he is perfectly good, it flows from him that he will make a perfectly good world in every possible way. He will avoid uh, evil and suffering. But if you can show that it's possible for God to have a morally justifying reason, it invalidates this. So what are so this is kind of the greater good defense saying that some goods or some evil states of affairs had to come about in order for other goods to exist. So let's let's run through these really quickly. So a full revelation of God Himself. Would we know that God is forgiving if there wasn't such a thing as sin? Nope. Would we know that God is just if there's no sin to punish? Nope. So there are certain qualities and attributes about God we wouldn't even know about him if it wasn't for the existence of evil and suffering. Second, on the soul-making theodicy, it's a cultivation of human moral virtues. And some of these, you know, are the same thing, like learning to forgive, learning to be reconciled, to persevere in the face of evil, so forth and so on. There are certain virtues we can go through a whole list of virtues that we, w we wouldn't even need to cultivate if evil and suffering didn't, weren't around. And then there are, and then Craig talks about other goods, such as um, it, may be, it may have been possible that, um, you know, without uh, the evil that had happened, you know, in China or something like that under uh, Mao's oppression, that the Chinese church wouldn't have had as much, um, you know, prosperity and, and expansion and so forth as, as they are currently having. So it could be that there are other evil states of affairs that need to obtain in order for um, a greater good to come about. And then lastly, and we'll get through this and take any questions and maybe touch on a few other things. Lastly, I distinguish between um, God's desire and God's ability, and maybe we touched on this earlier, but I mean it could be that on this account of God's ability in the face of human freedom and preserving human freedom, that it may be that God did desire to create a world that without suffering and evil, but he may not have been able to prevent it, given the fact that he wanted genuine relationships. So in this case, free will and genuine relationship was a greater good than preventing evil and suffering. So it's kind of like the greater good argument itself. God, on the one hand, he prefers a world without evil and suffering. On the other hand, he prefers a genuine relationship with free people that aren't robots. But he can't have both. And so because he considers this to be, a, because he considers uh, um, genuine relationship to be a greater good than the evil and suffering, he creates a world with genuine relationship, genuine uh, free will that allow for the possibility of evil and suffering to come to existence. So, we have shown that both of these hidden premises are not necessarily true. And so the argument from the three propositions doesn't go through. It's po because it's possible to say that God doesn't, can't just create any world he wants, and because he may have overriding uh, morally justified reasons for permitting evil, then evil and God are not logically Incoherent. The existence of both of them are not logically incoherent. So that's the skinny on just the logical problem of evil. Any questions? I kind of have a question. I don't sure. know if it's about one of Does a God allow evil or does he make evil? Yeah, that's a good question. That has to do with, um, I think that has to has to do with your, I, mean, I would say it goes back to your understanding of um, human freedom. Because on Craig's account of libertarian freedom, the reason evil came into existence was because humans chose against God's will. So God didn't cause it. He didn't determine it. He permitted it. He permitted the first two human beings to decide whether or not they were going to 
obey his will or disobey his will. If they disobeyed his will, evil comes into existence. Which is then the devil, or which is then him allowing? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's not, um, I mean, it's not the devil. It would be God's permission of human beings to have free choice, to really, truly free. So, I mean, you could ask the question of, you know, is God morally justified in permitting humans to choose against his will? And, I mean, I would say yes, because God doesn't have any kind of, like, moral duties that he's beholden to outside of himself. And also because, well, he wanted genuine human freedom, and human freedom required this. On Craig's account, you'd say that. Now, on... Um, on a compatibilist view, you would say that God causally determines everything that happens, including evil, but because humans are intermediary agents between God here, you have your human here, and you have the evil act here, because humans are intermediary agents who also will to do evil, and they're morally responsible, they are still uh, responsible for the evil that happens, even though causally it traces back to God. So, you, so depending upon how you understand human freedom is going to depend upon how you answer the question of, you know, how evil came into existence, whether God caused it, or he just permitted it. So, yeah. And evil has to be, we have to think about what is evil. Because if you're thinking, this may seem slippery to you, but this is historically the way that Orthodox Christians have, have answered this question. Um, they've said, starting with St. Augustine, that evil is not a thing. It's the perversion of a thing. So if God created everything that began to exist, um, that only applies to things, not, not the absence of good, not the absence of right. Um, and so evil is more akin to um, missing goodness than it is the presence of any concrete thing. So it's a it's a negation. It's a what's called a privation. And um, that is the view of probably the majority of Christians, but it's not the view of the majority of non-Christian philosophers. Mm -hmm. So there's some debate on whether well, like it's, it's essentially the issue is the ontology of evil. What is evil in, in and of itself? And that is um, a very um, tricky topic. Yes. So just kind of going along with that, couldn't you go back and argue back to like the existence of moral virtues that like without like the existence of humanity, the I guess without the existence of creation, the idea of evil and good don't necessarily exist. Like the idea of evil doesn't really exist without something that it's first like without the existence of good, like first starting on that. So I guess, could you argue that back and say that, like, these things exist because humanity exists? Like, I guess going back to, like, the idea of ethics? Mm -hmm. Or do you, I mean, because I feel like some people would say that, like, evil just exists by itself, like, out of nothing and no cause. Like, it just is there. Yeah. So, like, would that be kind of going back into the moral argument? Unless we were just like, oh. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it kind of touches on what we were just talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, you'd have to say that, you know, evil, it wasn't possible for evil to, to exist apart from creation. Because God, I mean, at least the definition of God that Christians work with and assume is that he's morally perfect, there's no evil or darkness in him. So it's not like a, a dualistic worldview where you have a good God over here and an evil God over here, and then, you know, the evil God creates evil and does evil. That's kind of like more Star Wars. Like Greek mythology. Yeah, yeah. Like the force. And, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but, but do you think that like a lot of, I feel like a lot of people who are, are not familiar with um, some of the like basis behind like theology and where the idea of like sane comes from, would you say that like people kind of have that view in general where they think of uh, the idea of sane as like the opposing God that has as much power and omnipotence and you know, whatever as as God does, where they see that as like, oh, well, evil exists because, you know, the devil exists. Right. Yeah, they could. Um, I'm not, I don't really know what, you know, non-Christians would say about Satan's relationship to God. I mean, I think we would say that, at least I would say that Satan was a created being, just like um, uh, 
Adam and Eve. And in fact, we could actually back up the argument and say evil came into existence when Satan, who had libertarian free will, cho chose against God's will to take pride in himself and to glorify himself and try to um, raise himself up to God's status or something like that. Um, so even, even then, you know, because Satan's a created being, the existence or the, the possibility of evils re it re relies upon God creating in the first place. So, yeah, Chad. This touches on kind of your common ends on the ontology of evil, too. And in Mere Christianity, Lewis, C.S. Lewis uses some examples uh, to kind of counteract this idea that you have the sort of supreme good force and the supreme evil force. And he goes in and he says, nobody does evil for evil's sake. So nobody's pursuing evil just for the sake of evil. It's always pursuing some good, but a perverted version of it. So in other words, a person like the devil or somebody might desire power, or a person might um, be desiring pleasure and overindulge in pleasure to get gluttony, but nobody sets out to just do evil. Even pursuing uh, something that ends up, or even when someone commits evil, it's because of a perversion or an extreme of of a good. And so I think that, in my mind, that makes a good, I think that does say something about the ontology of evil, um, as far as it not having this positive status as a thing that exists. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is a good example, but you could look at like World War II and Nazism, where, you know, the extermination of the Jews um, that program and, and others was kind of like a means to another end. You know, maybe maybe there was just some pure hatred toward the Jewish people, but it was for the purpose of purifying the Aryan race and creating, you know, a, a, a perfect nation and things like that. Um, and I'm not even sure that that's like a good thing in and of itself, but it just shows that like a lot of people do evil kind of uh, in a utilitarian way for for another purpose, for another reason to accomplish something else. Sometimes, which it is in, intrinsically good, but it's been perverted, or it just isn't good itself, so. Or they just think it's good. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Confusion. So it's almost eight. Um, we're not gonna run through the probabilistic or the emotional issue of evil. Um, you can look through my notes if you want. Essentially, I kinda just take Craig's line. I think he does a pretty decent job on both of those issues. Um, let's see if I want to say any last things in closing. Um, I would say this. I would say, if you go to the last page, not the resource page, the emotional problem of evil. Um, like I said, use your knowledge and research and understanding from the intellectual, the philosophical problem of evil to change the way you think and understand these things, which will influence how you feel and behave and so forth. Um, but, I mean, most of all, I would say um, the existential the pro problem of evil, where you're dealing with it in your everyday life, you have to go to the cross. Because it's at the cross where you find a God who empathizes, who understands, who's been through it himself, who cries, who suffers, who dies in order to overcome and defeat evil and suffering and eventually death itself and reconcile us to him. So it is, um, you know, it, the emotional problem of evil is not solvable by just thinking about it, sitting in your room, in your armchair, thinking about it. It's having that personal encounter with God mm -hmm. where you meet a God who knows you and loves you and created you and he cares about you and he deeply understands everything that you're going through. So I, I would just say that, like, that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. We have to do the intellectual work and everything like that, but there's also that really important interpersonal dimension. So, okay, any last questions? And I have some resources in the back here. Um, I would really, for that last point, I would really recommend Peter Kreef's book, Making Sense Out of Suffering. Kreef is a Catholic theologian. He does a phenomenal job of just kind of walking you through the issue of suffering and how to make sense of it. And then at the end, he does take you right back to Calvary. So, All right, well, thanks for coming tonight. Thank you.